This conference will now be recorded. Council Member Fox. Present. Council Member Casper. I am here. Council Member Boyle. Here. Council Member Strobin. And I believe he's excused. Council Member Servini. Present. And Mayor Thornton. And he is excused. He's as well. excused. Okay. Thank you, Maria. All right, Bronson, you are our leader this evening, so I will turn things over to you. All right, thank you. Um, so as you know, tonight we're going to go over uh, a training on the Open Public Meetings Act and the Public Records Act. And I think what I'll do, I'll, I'm going to start with the Open Public Meetings Act. Um, we'll take a short break once we get through open public meetings before we go into um, public records. Um, I'm going to try my best to make this kind of a dry subject, not too horribly boring for you. Uh, I'll probably move right along as I go through it, um, but don't let me stop you from, if you've got a question during the presentation, just go ahead and speak up and let me know what your question is uh, rather than waiting to the end, because uh, we may have to go back to a slide or you may forget your question, but just feel free to interrupt me uh, at any time. Okay. So the Open Public Meetings Act and the Public Records Act were, were passed together and they were the result of a citizen's initiative. Uh, and, and it was a sunshine law, basically. And Washington has one of the strongest sunshine laws in the country. Um, and part of what the initiative stated was that people insist on remaining informed so that they retain control over the instruments that they have created, which is government. So the Open Public Meetings Act uh, was enacted in 2014, and, and this uh, the, the provision, excuse me, for making <coughs> training mandatory for all members of governing bodies uh, was enacted in 2014. And this training has to be completed within 90 days of taking office and then at least every four years thereafter. So the uh, declaration of, of the legislature is that all meetings of the gov governing body of a public agency shall be open and persons shall be permitted to attend any meeting of the governing body except as otherwise provided in, in the chapter or the act. Um, so when we're talking about statutes and legislation, the meanings of words is critical. And uh, with respect to this declaration, the key terms are all meetings. So we'll have to talk about what is a meeting of a governing body of a public agency. So a meeting is uh, whenever a quorum, which is a majority of the council, uh, interacts in a way that action is taken. And what's been critical in the Open Public Meetings Act and the um, cases that have been decided by the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court, uh, probably the word Action is a critical term, as is the term meeting, but action is really very broadly defined to be the transaction of the official business of a public agency by a governing body, uh, included but not limited to, and then receipt of testimony, that's something that we obviously think occurs within a, within a meeting. Deliberations, which is the council's interaction and, and coming to a decision. But the two most encompassing terms 
our action includes discussions. It includes considerations, reviews, evaluations, and final actions, which is final actions are like votes. Um, but what really uh, brings a lot of interactions into the meaning of definition or action is discussions and considerations. So types of meetings uh, that you have, there's a traditional type of meeting, either a regular meeting or a special meeting, a workshop, a training like this one, retreats, but meetings can also be informal discussions if it occurs between a majority of the council members. Uh, a meeting doesn't require you to all be present in the same location or even to interact simultaneously. Um, a conference call with a majority of the, the council uh, where you're discussing city business, that's a meeting. An email exchange that includes a, a substantive discussion from a majority of the council, that's a meeting. And then there's serial meetings, uh, which it can be either um, a series of emails, a phone tree, even repeated discussions that occur verbally. Um, but what isn't a meeting is if you are simply uh, passively receiving information. So if you get it, I send out an email sometimes to all council members uh, advising you of something. Um, and if you receive that email and you're just getting information from me or from somebody else and you're not responding to it and the council's not interacting on it, that's not a meeting. So courts have been very clear that passive receipt of information is not a meeting but when you start interacting and discussing that then is a meeting if it's occurring between you know three or more of you um so like i said you know you have to think about gee uh there's three or more of us interacting is this a meeting um, some things that the legislation uh makes clear that is not a meeting is is simply traveling together is it a meeting just being together in the same place like a social gathering uh, i think yeah the museum event it's either happened or is coming up uh, again that's not a meeting just because three or more council members are there but if action is taken um, then it becomes a meeting and again that very broad definition of act of action including discussions or consideration of city business um texting during a meeting um yes, i see it happen sometimes uh it, it's not open uh the public is not able to see uh what is going on when you're texting so that's it's not um consistent with having an open public meeting when you're receiving input that is the public is not able to see. So there's been four cases on the issue of serial meetings uh, decided by the Court of Appeals in the Washington Supreme Court um, since 2001. The first case that really uh, dealt with what we call serial meetings is a case involving the Battleground School District, and it was Wood v. Battleground School District. And in that case, uh, there was an exchange of emails between district board members regarding the performance of a couple of employees. So clearly, it uh, was a matter uh, performance of employees that was district business. It occurred between a majority of the members of the school board. And the court said that in this case, that active exchange of information and opinions in these emails, as opposed to the passive receipt of information, suggests that there was a collective intent to deliberate and or discuss board business. And a meeting occurred uh, that was in violation of the Open Public Meetings Act because it wasn't open to the public, it wasn't noticed. Um, it was just this email exchange. And actually there were several emails exchanged between several members of the school board. 
So in that case, the court found that the act had been violated through this email exchange. Um, there's another case. Uh, this one was from the Supreme Court Citizens Alliance versus San Juan County. And in this case, um, there was uh, some communication uh, between individual council members, but the court found that there was not a collective intent to meet because there was no evidence that the commissioners were aware that the communications included a majority of the county commission. Uh, so in that case, email exchange between commissioners A and B, another email exchange between commissioners C and D, uh, A and B didn't know C and D were exchanging emails and so there wasn't any evidence that a majority of the commissioners knew that an email exchange was occurring that involved the majority of the commission. So in the absence of that evidence, the court said that here, we can't find that there was a collective intent to meet and therefore there was not a violation of the public meetings or the Open Public Meeting Act. Um, the third case was uh, Egan versus the City of Seattle, a Court of Appeals case. And this case really involved a pretty complex uh, set of exchanges. This was a case involving the City of Seattle uh, pass a, what we call a head tax, where employers are taxed based on the number of employees that they had. Uh, Seattle passed that tax. It was really quite a large tax on large employers. It was very unpopular. And uh, the council quickly uh, began considering repealing the tax. And there was exchanges over a multitude of platforms. There were in-person meetings, there were phone calls, there were emails, there were text messages. Uh, there was a press release that was drafted by staff and sent to council members. Um, and there the court uh, found that um, if a majority of council members were aware of the communications occurring between a quorum, um, then it was a, uh, a violation of the act, even if not all majority of the members were on each email. Um, in the case of the, the evidence wasn't conclusive, the court returned uh, the matter to the trial court to take more evidence. Um, what was particularly concerning to the Supreme Court was a press release that included um, a phrase, uh, we've heard you addressing the taxpayers. We've heard you, this tax is unpopular. And the court said, you know, there it looks like uh, the council is speaking as a we, you know, we've heard you. Uh, sounds like it's a majority of, of the council. Uh, is pitching in on this press release, but it wasn't very clear from the evidence, and so it was set back for further trial. But the the point of the I think the what the case really illustrates is that um, it doesn't just have to be an email where all or a quorum of the council is on the same email. It can be a series of emails or texts or phone calls, discussions, but when it appears that a majority of the council is interacting and having a discussion on city business, then you have a violation of the Open Public Meetings Act. The fourth case, uh, City of Seattle again versus Casberg. Um, in this case, the council was considering condemning beachfront property for public access. Um, here, excuse me, emails were sent between council members and members of the public, uh, but the, the, there weren't emails between council members. So in this case, 
the court said that, uh, you know, communications between individual accounts members and members of the public uh, do not tr trigger serial meeting concerns. So even if you had a majority of council members interacting with constituents, um, that's permissible. Uh, as long as you don't have a majority of the council members interacting with each other and having discussions about city business. And in Casper, there wasn't any ev evidence that the council members communicated with each other on this con condemnation action. So I'm gonna leave the subject of serial meetings for the time being, but I, I just opened up for any questions that you might have about serial meetings. Bronson, can you reference um, the possibility, or, or uh, I guess just clarify for everybody, um, the use of um, both personal cell phones and business uh, laptops and emails and exchanging um, city business as well and how that gets wrapped into some of these um, informational requests or subpoenas and, and such just as a cautionary. Uh, yeah, um, so for Open Public Meetings Act purposes, it, it doesn't matter what device the interaction occurs on, it can be a city issued device, it can be your personal device. Again, it can even be in-person verbal conversations, um, but it's whether there is an interaction about city business, a discussion uh, involving a quorum of the council. When we get to public records, we're gonna talk more about if you're doing city business on a personal device, uh, it, whatever you're doing is is still a public record even if it's even if it's on a personal device and we'll talk about it your personal device then becoming subject to searches so moving on from serial meetings then um, the issue of whether or not a public meeting has occurred comes up sometimes when a council forms a committee and uh, the committee then meets and um, the, the question becomes, is a meeting of a committee subject to the Open Public Meetings Act? And the answer is it depends. Um, the meetings of governing bodies are subject to the Open Public Meetings Act. And when it comes to a committee, if the committee acts on behalf of the council, or conducts hearings or takes testimony or public comment, then the meeting has to be open. So again, phrases and the meaning of phrases become very critical. So what's it mean when a committee acts on behalf of the governing body or the council? Um, if all that a committee does is make a recommendation and it doesn't have the authority to uh, do anything else on behalf of the council, but is simply an advisory and it makes a recommendation, uh, then it is not subject to the Open Public Meetings Act. But when it exercises any actual or decision-making authority um, for the council, then it is uh, acting on behalf of the council and it uh, is subject to the Open Public Meetings Act or just going back for a second, or if it takes, you know, conducts a hearing, takes testimony or public comment, then it has to be open. And um, even though a, a committee may be uh, simply advisory, uh, frequently uh, councils or commissions decide as a matter of policy to uh, have a committee meeting be subject to the Open Public Meetings Act. So there, there's, earlier I mentioned meetings being either regular or special. Um, a regular meeting uh, is a meeting that is established by ordinance, um, resolution, bylaw, or rule. So in the center, we have an ordinance making the second and fourth Wednesdays uh, 
our regular meetings uh, and the time is specified. So um, special meetings are different. Uh, they can be called by uh, the mayor or a majority of the board members. And when you have a special meeting, you have to do 24 hours notice to board members and the media. In your notice, you have to include the time, place, location, the agenda. Um, members can waive notice, council members can waive notice if they attend or submit a waiver. Uh, but what's different about a special meeting from a regular meeting is in a special meeting, you can only act on matters that are included in the notice of the special meeting. Whereas in a regular meeting, uh, we have the ability to add items to the agenda and act on those. Um, for regular meetings, uh, we there is a requirement to post our agendas online at least 24 hours in advance of the meeting. Like I just indicated, agendas can be amended, things can be added to the agenda even after posting. Um, and the failure to post doesn't uh, invalidate an otherwise legal action. So um, you can go ahead and take the action and it's not invalidated, uh, but you really, uh, we do need to get those agendas posted 24 hours in advance. Talk about executive sessions. Uh, the executive sessions, there's probably more than a dozen uh, enumerated in the uh, uh, statute. It's uh, 42.30.110. Uh, but th the more common ones are <clears throat> reasons for having executive sessions. Uh, and these are sessions that are not open to the public. Um, you, you don't have to have an agenda. You don't have to take minutes of the special meeting. Um, but our, our more frequent subjects uh, or purposes of executive sessions are acquisition of real estate, um, sale or lease of real estate, uh, and evaluating charges made against a public officer or employee. Uh, the sale or lease of real estate, um, again, your action to sell or lease has to be done in the in the open meeting but your discussion about matters that are focused on price for sale or lease uh, can be had in the executive session but you can't talk about anything related to the sale or lease of real estate and the case uh, involving that was columbia river keepers versus the port of vancouver and that had to do with the oil terminal lease and the uh, port board met in executive session and talked about a wide variety of things uh, related to the lease, including uh, insurance requirements, um, environmental concerns, and the uh, Supreme Court held that the port violated the Open Public Meeting Act because their discussion in executive session wasn't simply focused on the price at which the property should be leased. Other purposes for uh, executive session are to uh, evaluate qualifications uh, or review an applicant's performance, uh, to evaluate the qualifications of a candidate for appointment to an elective office, um, so again, there we evaluate qualifications in the executive session, that's permissible, but the interviews of the candidates and the actual selection of the person to be appointed to office has to occur in the open public meeting. Um, discussion with legal counsel on enforcement actions or potential litigation are permissible to occur in executive session and then discussion of labor negotiations. Uh, technically, it's not uh, subject to the Open Public Meetings Act at all. So 
when we have an executive session, um, you as council members and me as your attorney and anybody else in the executive session uh, are under a legal obligation not to disclose the information to discuss outside of the executive session. And if you disclose the discussion that occurred in executive session, it's a violation of the ethics of municipal officers, that's a state law, and the consequences can be it's a criminal misdemeanor, um, it's official misconduct, um, and it's potential grounds for forfeiture or office or recall. So you have to be very careful that uh, the discussions that occur in executive session remain confidential and they're not discussed um, outside of the executive session. So what happens if we took action in a meeting that was not open? It wasn't noticed, it wasn't, the public wasn't able to observe it. Uh, what happens? And again, you know, remembering that action includes those two broad terms, discussion and consideration. So the, the first consequence is that the action that was taken is nullified. Um, there can be attorney's fees and costs imposed against the city uh, if somebody brings a lawsuit uh, for the violation of the act. If the violation was knowing, um, <clears throat> there are civil penalties. It's $500 for the first violation, $1,000 for every subsequent violation. And again, uh, there's potential for forfeiture of office or recall. And by knowing, it doesn't mean necessarily knowing that you violated the act, but knowing that you engaged in a discussion or consideration or other action uh, and knowing that it was occurring between a majority of the council members. Um, that's what makes a violation knowing and subject to penalty and potential forfeiture of office. So what else do you do if there is a violation of the act? Um, there's ways to cure the violation. Uh, so in the, in the case of the port where they had the discussion of uh, the lease and the executive session, but the discussion went outside of the boundaries of what you can do in an executive session on a lease, uh, there the court, the port had to go back into open session and uh, have the discussion occur openly uh, and then take the action in the open meeting. So uh, to, to cure the uh, OPMA, the Open Public Meeting Act violation, you can't just do a summary approval of the lease in that case. You can't just say, well, I move to approve the lease, pass, done. You have to kind of go back to square one and have the full discussion regarding the lease and everything that you talked about that should have occurred in open session. You have to have that full consideration done in the open. And you also have to provide the opportunity for uh, the opposing parties to have their input. So with COVID, there's been some tweaks to the Open Public Meetings Act. Uh, the governor's proclamation 2028 uh, now provides that um, public meetings, they have you have to have a virtual component where people are able to, at a minimum, hear and speak with counsel uh, by phone or by um, you know video conferencing um, at the meeting. If you're having an in-person meeting, you have to follow the Department of Labor and Industries rules for business meetings and miscellaneous venues. 
Uh, so there's a specific set of labor and industry rules for what they call business meetings and miscellaneous venues. And in, in those, those rules provide that face coverings are required. Uh, you have to post signs at the entrance advising people that masks or face coverings are required. Um, you have to have somebody available to engage with people who are there who are not following the rules. Um, they, there used to be capacity limits. Those were done away with in January. Uh, and the social distancing requirement is, is no longer imposed. So um, that gets me through the Open Public Meetings Act presentation. Uh, there was a request for some resources on uh, additional information or where can I go uh, to find additional information about the Open Public Meetings Act. Um, if you're not familiar with it already, MRSC, that stands for the Municipal Research Service Center. Um, it, you can just uh, do mrsc.org and go to their website. They have a publication there, which is really excellent. I highly encourage you to take time to review it. It's called Knowing the Territory. Um, here's the, the link to that publication. Um, the Attorney General's Office has open public government training, uh, both video and online publications. And this is the link to uh, that resource. So. Go ahead and hit me with your hardest questions on the Open Public Meetings Act. Questions, anyone? I think you did a good job explaining it. I, I think <laughs> I'm, I feel comfortable. <laughs> okay. Well, good. Um, do you guys want to forge ahead into public records? I mean, I got through Open Public Meetings Act pretty quickly, which is a good thing. Um, we could take a five minute break or we could go right into public records, uh, whatever people want to do. You guys all right with going ahead? All right, let's move ahead, Bronson. Okay. So, Public records. Um, again, like I said at the beginning of the Open Public Meetings Act presentation, uh, the Public Records Act was part of that same Sunshine uh, initiative. And when I talk about initiative, initiative is a law that is brought to the legislature through a petition of the public. And in 1972, uh, the, the roots of the Open Public Meetings Act and the Public Records Act was a uh, petition that was signed by 72% of the Washington voters, which is really um, an incredible feat to get that many voters to sign a petition. Uh, and one of the uh, statements in the petition was that the people in delegating authority don't give their public service the right to decide what's good for the people to know and what is not good for them to know. So agencies uh, have to make documents available to the public for inspection and copying of all public records unless it's uh, exempted by a specific exemption uh, in the Public Records Act or another statute. So we'll get into what constitutes a public record, um, but let's start with how, how do people make a request for a public record? And there, the law is the request doesn't have to be in any particular form. Uh, we have to honor requests, whether we receive them by mail uh, or email or text or verbally. Uh, if there's a request for a public record, um, we have to respond to it uh, and 
make the record available for inspection and copying, but a request has to be for an identifiable public record. Um, so we have to be able to tell, well, what is it that you're asking for? And uh, the identifiable requirement uh, came up in the context of, uh, I think it was a prison inmate asked a government agency for every public record they had <laughs> as sort of a harassment. Uh, and there the court said, well, that's that's not a specifically identifiable public record and the agency didn't have to respond to it. But again, you know, we um, we encourage people to use the online form for requesting public records. And there's a good reason to do that. And that is that it uh, helps people identify what it is that they're seeking. It gives the city a sort of point of contact and single point of entry for public records requests, makes it easier to uh, track the request uh, and respond to it. So while the, the, technically the record request doesn't have to be in a particular form, uh, it is permissible to encourage people to use uh, a city provided either printed form or online form. When you make a request, you don't have to say why you're making the request. Uh, the only limitation on making requests or the purpose for making a request is that you can't ask for a list of individuals uh, that you're gonna use for a commercial purpose. So if I'm a vendor and I wanna sell a product to uh, businesses in the city, um, I can't ask for a list of everybody who has a business license because I want to send them a flyer uh, trying to sell them something. That, so requesting lists of individuals for a commercial purpose isn't allowed under the act. But other than that, when somebody makes a public records request, um, you have to respond to it. And the response uh, can't be, well, well, tell me why. Why, why do you want to know that? Why do you want that record? Uh, they don't have to tell you and you shouldn't be asking them. So in, in responding to a request, uh, once you get it, you have to give an initial response within five business days. Um, part of the uh, COVID world that we live in is now that, re that obligation to respond in five business days only applies if the uh, request is made electronically. But once you get the request, you've got uh, four initial responses that um, have to be provided in that five business day period. So, I mean, virtually all our requests we get electronically. Um, so in that five days, you either provide the record or you give an estimate, a reasonable estimate of the time that it's gonna to take to produce the record, or you ask for clarification if the request isn't clear, um, or you deny the request. If a request is for something that's gonna involve a large volume of records, you can provide uh, the records in installments. If you're claiming that some of the records are exempt from production. You have to produce what we call an exemption log. And in that, you have to identify the record that you're claiming is exempt. So an example would be an email between uh, the city attorney and the mayor dated August 18th, 2020. Um, and then you have to explain what exemption applies to that record. So you could say it's it's exempt by the attorney client privilege. Um, and but you don't just cite a statute, it's exempt by you know RCW 426120. You, you have to say no, it's it's exempt because it's a communication between the attorney and the client. And then in some cases uh, a request comes in and um, it may be 
requesting information involving a third party that we want to give notice to. So an example would be um, a request comes in for a set of plans that were submitted to the uh, city by an architect and uh, somebody wants those plans. We might want to give the architect a notice saying, hey, somebody wants the plans that you've produced. Uh, you might claim an intellectual property or something. You know, if we're giving you notice and if you think there's a basis on which we shouldn't produce the record, uh, tell us what that basis is, you know, and if we don't agree with you, you can go to court and try and prevent us from producing the record. So that's basically how we initially respond to public records requests. Um, so again, records, uh, there are any document uh, that concerns the city's business. So, you know, it's very, very broad in terms of what is a public record. Um, but what well, sometimes we get are people who are really what they're asking for is, I want information, um, not a specific record, but uh, I want uh, an analysis of all accidents that occurred at the intersection of 4th Street and Main Street. Um, well, that's asking for an analysis to be produced. That's that's not a public record. It's not, I want an accident report, you know, of this accident that happened on such and such a date. It's not asking for a particular document. Uh, and we don't have to provide analysis or information. Our obligation is to provide records and the request has to be specific enough that we can identify what record is you're asking for. So let's go to the definition of public records. Um, again, like I said, it's, it's a broad definition. It's any writing, regardless of the physical form or the characteristic. So it doesn't matter if it's in ink, pencil, uh, megabytes, <laughs> bits, uh, electronic, um, it, it's any record that we have and, and they're becoming more and more electronic as opposed to hard copy, but hard copy files are public records as well. It's information that's relating to the conduct of government um, or the performance of a government proprietary function like water, sewer, that type of thing. So again, very, very broad, relating to the conduct of government. And that was either prepared, owned, used, or retained by uh, the local agency. So when we get into disputes about whether or not some document is a public record, um, very rarely is the dispute about whether it's a writing or not. It, it, so it's always going to be a writing of some type, but the the questions usually focus on does this relate to the conduct of government? So, um, a email from you to a friend or even a council member that is just talking about the weather uh, has nothing to do with the conduct of government. Uh, that's not a public record, even though it may be council member to council member, council member to constituent. If it's not relating to the conduct of government, um, it's not a public record. And then the other thing is that it's prepared, owned, used, or retained by the local agency. And where this comes up sometimes, and there was a case in Clark County um, where uh, it was the Clark Public Utilities and they were building a, a natural gas fired um, power plant. And they were specifying a particular kind of turbine that they wanted uh, whoever was gonna submit a request for proposal to build this uh, plant. 
they wanted specifications of the kind of turbine and the performance of the turbine that was going to be provided. And so they got a, a response to their request for proposal and the uh, person making the proposal had a set of specifications for the turbine, but they didn't give it to the utility. They told the utility, if you want to look at our specifications, you can come to our office and we'll, you can read the document, but we're not going to give it to you. Um, and so the utility did that. They went, they reviewed the specifications, they awarded the contract to the vendor, and then there was a public record request for those specifications. Uh, and the utility said, we don't have them, we didn't prepare them, we don't own them, we, um, we didn't retain them, we can't produce them <laughs> because we don't have them. Uh, and it went to court and the utility uh, ended up losing uh, because the Supreme Court said, well, even though you don't have the document and you didn't prepare it and you don't own it, you used it. When you went and you reviewed the specification that the vendor's business, uh, you used that information to make the award of the contract. And therefore, that document, those specifications become a public record. Uh, so. So, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Serenio is asking about public records and the use of uh, personal devices. And uh, this is something that you need to be cognizant of. Um, the location of a record, like I said, isn't the only test. And we just talked about the Clark Public Utility case where you know, there wasn't a record at the utility offices, it was at a private company's office. It didn't matter. Uh, the record was used and therefore it was subject to inspection. So public records can be on your personal devices, third party contractors, uh, your laptop, your phone. It can be uh, your Facebook account, wherever you're discussing city business. You have a public record. So when you have um, a public record, on a personal device, the Supreme Court in this um, union case, SEIU Local 925 versus University of Washington, the court said, if the record's on your personal device, we're going to decide whether or not the record uh, was produced or used in the scope of your employment. So there, there's three things that will qualify for making it a public record is one, if your job requires you to produce it or your employer directed you to produce it, or, and the, the third one's the broad one, if it furthers the employer's interest. So if you're doing something that's furthering uh, the employer or the city's interest, and uh, presumably if it's related to city business, that's what it is, um, it is gonna be a record that you're going to be required to produce, regardless of where, if it's on a city, um, well, if it's on a on an agency device, like a city laptop, um, the scope of employment test doesn't apply. Uh, but if it's on a personal device, uh, then if it qualifies for any of those three conditions, uh, the record would have to be produced unless an exemption applies. So what happens if you have a, you've used your phone, you've texted about city business and a, and a public record request comes in for, I want council member X, uh, any discussion that he or she may have had about pick your item of city business, you know, passing an ordinance, uh, awarding a contract, um, whatever, any city business. You have this tension between, you know, I've got a right of privacy in my personal devices uh, 
and I shouldn't be required to just turn them over to anybody to go searching through all my personal information uh, to see if there's a public record there or not. So there's privacy on the one hand, but then on the other hand, there's a duty to produce the public record. And so here's what the court has come down and, and said, here's the protocol that you have to go through um, if there's a request for a record on a personal device. You, in this case, I'm gonna say you, the council member, you have to perform a diligent good faith search on your device for that record. So let's say we had on the agenda uh, an ordinance involving uh, regulating vendors in public streets and you texted uh, with a constituent or with a council member, doesn't matter, you had a communication about that subject, which is city business. And there's a request comes in and now they say, I want every record, whether it's on a city device or a personal device, text message, email, Facebook posting uh, concerning this subject. You, the council member, you have to go through your devices, you have to produce any record that is responsive to the request. Um, you have to describe in a sworn statement how you conducted the search and what you found. Um, so you have to you know, specify, I looked at this device, I used these search terms, um, and here's what I found. Um, and if you're not producing a record, uh, you have to identify what it is and what the reason is that you claim that you don't have to produce it. And if it meets a statutory exemption, that's fine. We will do what I described before about an exemption log and identify the record and why it's exempt. Uh, but, but that's the, uh, the exercise that we need to go through looking for records on personal devices. Um, the fees that you can charge for responding to records requests are nominal. They're, they're For the most part, they're not worth even charging. Um, it's 10 cents a printed page, or if you're popping it to a um, some type of media, thumb drive or CD, DVD, um, it, it's such a small amount that uh, we frequently just don't even, it costs more money to produce a bill and charge it than it's, you recover through the statutory fee schedule. Uh, so it's, a, it's an expensive proposition. You, you know, it takes a lot of time for city staff to uh, respond to requests, to understand them, to search for records and then produce them. But you can't charge any of that time spent searching or clarifying records requests and going through all the records and coming up with all the different documents um, that is not recoverable by the city. So what records are exempt? Um, <laughs> there are within the Public Records Act itself there's 46 exemptions and then there's what we call other statute exemptions. Uh, so other state or federal statutes may make um, records private. So uh, examples are, yeah, everything from license plates to child support to criminal records. Um, th there's literally hundreds of records that could come, or excuse me, hundreds of exemptions that can come into play. Uh, but when a court's looking at your response to a public record request, um, the, the courts always start with saying, the Public Record Act imposes a broad duty. We're going to interpret the requirements of the act broadly to require production, and we're going to interpret exemptions narrowly. So it, uh, when you're claiming an exemption, uh, you have to know that you're on solid ground because the court's going to take a very 
narrow or limited view to a claim of an exemption. So I want to talk, privacy is probably one of the main concerns uh, when people are asking to see public records that may concern you. There isn't a general privacy exemption in the Public Records Act. Um, there are some uh, exemptions which uh, invasion of privacy uh, comes into play. Uh, if, if a request is for information uh, that's highly offensive to a reasonable person and it's not of any legitimate concern to the public, uh, a exemption uh, may come into play, a privacy ex exemption. Um, so an example uh, pretty common comes up is somebody's requesting information, personal information, that's in an employee's file. I want to see any record related to an investigation of or any allegation of misconduct by employee X. Um, what the courts do there is they, you know, and we claim, well, no, that's, we're, we're claiming a right of privacy to that. Um, the court's gonna look at that and say, well, is the information in this, would that be highly offensive to a reasonable person? Is it going into matters that would be embarrassing? Um, and and uh, oftentimes it'd be like a, a claim of uh, uh, sexual harassment. It, if it's unfounded and uh, highly offensive, a court would uphold the claim of exemption. But if it was found to be <coughs> um, what we call a founded uh, complaint or a complaint where the investigation concluded that, yes, this is a legitimate complaint, then it's a matter of legitimate public concern and it has to be disclosed. Recently, the Public Records Act has been modified to uh, exempt some specific personal information uh, for employees because people were abusing the Public Records Act and asking for uh, birth dates, addresses, phone numbers, uh, you know, social security numbers. Uh, and so the legislature did create an exemption that exempts uh, a number of uh, items of personal information and employee files. And likewise, uh, there's an amendment recently uh, where date of birth uh, photographs uh, of employees or volunteers have been exempted. So what do we do when, when there's a, a record and we claim an exemption? Um, what we do is we we don't withhold the entire record usually, um, but instead we redact or black out those portions which are within um, an exemption. And we, like I say, provide a, a brief description of how the exemption or how the information is covered by an exemption. Um, so again, uh, what I do uh, when I have emails that have been requested uh, that I've done city business and, and a request comes in, I'll go through it and I will only redact or black out the portion of my email that is actually uh, the attorney client privilege communication. So I leave in, hi, how are you today? Did you have a good weekend? You know, that kind of stuff that does not get redacted, just the privileged information uh, would get redacted. Likewise, with other types of exemptions, um, we just black out what is specifically covered by the exemption and produce the remaining portions of the record. So um, there are retention schedules. 
you have to, if there's a public record, we are required to keep it for a period of time that is specified by the Washington State Archivist. And uh, there is a, what we call, there's a local government common records retention schedule. It's updated almost annually. Um, probably for council members, uh, the retention schedule that's going to most frequently come into play is uh, communications to you or from you concerning city business as a two-year retention requirement. And then at the end of the two years, the record needs to be transferred to the state archivist and the state archivist determines whether or not they are going to retain the record any longer or not. Uh, so that's the sort of general retention schedule. Um, but there's, I mean, this list in the retention schedule, uh, it, there's dozens of different retention requirements depending on what the document is. So I'm talking about the one that would be most communications to and from council members would be the one that would most frequently uh, pertain to you, but there could be other uh, schedules uh, and retention requirements that come into play depending on what the record is. So if you've got that text on your personal device and you're discussing city business, the legal requirement is that you keep that for at least two years. Uh, it has to be searchable. So if your texts go away in less than two years, um, that's a violation of the Public Records Act. Um, and at the end of the two years, the record is supposed to be transferred to the state archivist. So how do you deal with this situation if you're doing city business on your personal devices? Uh, one method is you have the dedicated email account. So you have your city email account and you do your city business on that account and not on your personal account. Another method is uh, agencies issue devices uh, to employees and council members for you for agency business and you use that device rather than your own personal devices. Um, there's some electronic document sharing solutions uh, that are available. Um, city policies uh, can specify uh, that you have to use a particular kind of record retention software. Um, I don't think we have that in the city of the center. Um, probably the most important thing is that you be consistent in your practice uh, and so that you know one that how to retrieve the record, where it would be, that it would be kept for that required minimum of two years, um, and that uh, you use records uh, schedules, retention schedules to appropriately delete records in a timely manner. And that's really more for the city as an organization, less for you personally, um, but lots of times uh, cities and counties accumulate a lot of records. They don't delete them at the end of the retention period and they end up with vast amounts of records that they then have to go through in response to any uh, record request from the public. Hey, Bronson, uh, Dennis Snubrock with a question. Um, if I'm using a, a personal email account to send emails to the city or other commissioners, am I safe if I include my city email address on that email? That's a good question. And um, th that is a good practice because then it will end up um, being retained on that city email account and be searchable in that account. Um, you, you ask, are you safe? And so I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that. But I, I will also point out, though, that it does not preclude a request for a search of your personal device. So even though it went to your city email account, um, 
because metadata is a record, a person could want require that the metadata from your personal device be made available for inspection. And okay, and that I guess that's what I was considering safe. My personal uh, devices would not be safe in that case. It would still be subject to search for metadata. Um, and, you know, as a practical matter, uh, in my experience, most people who request records, when we produce the email, um, you know, and it's a, a complete disclosure of what was said in the email, that satisfies the person that they, they've gotten the document. Uh, it, it, I've, it can happen that people want to actually see the metadata, uh, but it's relatively infrequent. Uh, so I, I encourage inc including that city email because I would say in 95, 99% of the cases, uh, city staff could do the search through the email account, the city email account, produce the record, and we're done. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I, we already touched on this a little bit, disposing of public records. Um, again, you have to go to that state archivist retention schedule and they have their list and it's done by pretty much by topic. It was the document related to an ordinance or a charter or a project or this or that. And then what type of document is it? And then they will say, retain it for X period of time and then either destroy or send to the state archivist for review. So enforcement and penalties, um, the, the court uh, can impose statutory penalties to be awarded to the person making the request if they aren't provided with a complete uh, disclosure. Uh, the court will order the payment of the requester's attorney's fees and costs. Uh, those fees and costs can often be more than the amount of the penalties, uh, but there have been cases where cities have been fined hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, the court will order the disclosure or of all or part of the withheld record. Uh, and, and there's also a, you know, there's a cost in terms of loss of public trust. There's a cost in terms of public perception of the city uh, when it's found to have not complied with the with the Public Records Act. So there's more than just the monetary costs that are at stake for a violation. All right, uh, same resources for uh, public record information. Uh, MRSC, that knowing the territory. Uh, if you haven't gone through it, uh, I, I know you'll you'll find it. It's really an interesting document. I use it myself because uh, it's just a good general overview of uh, laws that apply to the operation of government. Um, oh, geez. Sorry about that. <laughs> the and then that same attorney general's. Uh, Call from um, This will stop in just a second. <laughs> okay, this training. They, there's both Open Public Meetings Act information and Public Records Act information at those sites. Um, Maria can circulate this uh, slide presentation to you so you can have these uh, links available to you. Uh, and again, if you have questions on Public Records Act, I'm happy to try and answer them. Questions, anybody? Well, I appreciate everyone for um, participating. And 
thank you, Bronson, for leading us through once again. Um, it, it just always helps us kind of march into the new year with everything and keeping that important aspect of what we do each day in our local government and business and even in our interactions with the community um, at, at our, you know, right, keep us, you know, on track and, and our ethics and integrity at every step and recognize we, we're working together for the same cause. So I appreciate everyone's time. And if there are no further questions, we will adjourn the um, training session. Okay, well, thank you everybody for your attention and uh, I'm available. If questions come to mind, uh, just let me know. Yep, Bronson.